do we expect rescheduling? And is rescheduling important? I think the question, without a doubt, rescheduling, removing to ADE, it's a significant catalyst for the group and stocks would move up significantly. This is The Dime. Dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Field, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Pablo Zwanich, managing partner at Zunik Associates. Pablo, thanks for taking time. How are you doing today? Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Kellen. I'm doing great, and thank you for having me in your podcast. Excited to dive in. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. Really excited to talk to Pablo. Really excited to talk to you too, Brian. And, you know, I think that this is a topic that is ubiquitous across the entire industry and all industries in general. So I think I'm looking forward to getting Pablo's take on a lot of these these areas as far as stocks and investing goes. Yeah, I, I think this is a topic that everybody is very interested in. And given the framework of the complexities of the cannabis industry, I think it's great that we're going to have Pablo's kind of perspective on today, some of his research and, and help some of the retail investors that are one of the ones out there really pushing the torch for this industry, kind of understand what they're getting involved with and maybe how to make better decisions, consume some data and to learn forward. So Pablo, for our listeners unfamiliar about you, can you give it a background about yourself and then kind of how you found your way into the cannabis industry? Right. So look, I've been an equity analyst, mostly in the consumer space, consumer slash retail healthcare for about, you know, call it more than 15 years. Uh, Cover a number of the large CPG companies in the alcohol, you know, non-alcoholic drink space, Constellation Brands, Coca-Cola, some uh, personal care stocks, food stocks over the years, you know, very liquid stocks, large market cap, uh, widely followed by institutional investors, whether, you know, for for uh, short-term trading or long-term trading, but or for dividend or for growth. So that's been my career. What happened in college, you know, back in 2015, 16, 17, some of the stocks I was covering, like Constellation Brands, um, you know, Molson Coors, Anheuser Busch, even some of the tobacco stocks, which I did not cover but fall into the CPG space, also began to invest in cannabis. And of course, you had legalization in Canada and other, you know, countries uh, legalizing medical cannabis. So I began to pay more attention to the space. Um, as a result of that, I joined Canto Fitzgerald in 2019 to fully cover the, the cannabis space, launching about 37 stocks in about four years, of, you know, plant touching and plant touching uh, US, Canada, overseas. And since uh, April last year, I have my own firm where I do pretty much the same thing, publish research on, on the sector and on, on specific stocks. So that's on my background. I like to think of the industry on a global basis and, and take a long-term view. I always say, you know, as, as disclosure, if you're someone that wants to day trade the space, uh, you know, by all means, I won't stop you, but I won't be your guy because, uh, you know, there's just too much technicals and too much, uh, too much, uh, too much risk. Uh, so uh, I like to take more of a medium, long-term view, but that, that's, that's what, I, what I'm doing in the space right now. Yeah. What would you say has been uh, the most unique change or difference between covering the, the cannabis sector versus kind of your other traditional consumer packaged goods sectors? Yeah, I would say, obviously, on the one hand, it's a growth opportunity, right? Uh, significant compared to, uh, call it the CPG space. But on the other hand, it's uh, it's just a dependence on the regulatory environment, right? Uh, on how changes at the state level or federal level may impact the industry. So those are the two biggest changes. I would add to that, you know, the technicalities, which means institutional investors are not widely invested in the space, right? They don't participate. Uh, so that's been a bit of an adjustment process. And, and the reason I say that, and I'll give this uh, more as an anecdote, you know, that week in January before everyone is back, you know, call it the 3rd or the 4th of January, you know, I remember hosting uh, investor calls with the CEO of Kellogg on, on the 3rd of January and then, you know, the one from the CEO of General Mills on the 4th, call it Wednesday, Thursday, a few, you know, six, seven years ago. And you would think that these are, you know, boring stocks, low growth stocks. Uh, uh, but, you know, I had like 120 people on the call, institutional investors on those uh, calls on days that not everybody's back yet. Right. And the reason I bring that up, it's important to think about that. And I think the example is valid is because in those stocks, large cap, CPG, low growth, dividend paying, there is a lot of institutional investor interest, right? Whether they are hedge funds or long only investors. And there they are, you know, on the 3rd and 4th of January, joining a call to discuss, you know, the growth of cereal. So what I'm trying to say in the case of cannabis, the institutional investor involvement is very limited. It's mostly retail, but that also shows you the opportunity, right? It's not just on the growth in terms of the consumption and sales of the products, but it's also the growth that would come for stocks 
once you have wider institutional in investor involvement. Uh, at the moment, the, the involvement is is limited. So those are, I would say, the three main main uh, main main differences. I can I expand on those subjects, but yeah, those are the three main differences. Yeah. Before we get into institutional investors, I really want to understand more about from your perspective, as you were kind of getting nuanced with the space, understanding the regulatory differences, the state by state differences, and then as yeah. you were digging down, understanding that some of these companies are what's called vertically integrated and operating six or seven different businesses all within one market that are independent from the other markets. Was that more complicated than you originally realized and understanding this operational excellence is critical from a fundamental standpoint, from a positioning of X, Y, and Z, and making sure that the whole food chain works accordingly in order to hit certain numbers? Yeah, no, for sure. It's a bit of an adjustment process, right? Every market is different, whether it's state level or at country level in the case of Canada. But that's that's just part of the, the equation, right? If you're analyzing beer stocks, you want to understand, you know, distribution state by state, you want to understand off-premise, on-premise. So yeah, it's just part of the research process. But but look, I mean, on your question, I guess the way I would I, I would step back and say, look, in the US market, right, retail sales of cannabis this year, legal sales are going to be about $30 billion, right? Most estimates talk about the illicit market being about in total, illicit and legal about 100 billion, right? So you've been able to convert about, call it 25, 30% of the, of the market to legal sales. You still have a large proportion of sales in the illicit market, right? But then on top of that, you know, coming back to a question comparing with CPG, um, it, it's a growth opportunity, right? One thing is that once you legalize, you would say, okay, we go from 30 billion to, to, to 100 billion, capturing all that illicit market. But the truth is that once you have legalized the product, less, there's less stigma, there's more product innovation, wider distribution, the market should be much bigger than that, right? So when you're thinking Coca-Cola, right, sales and cereal probably going down, right, because of dietary concerns or whatever. Uh, in the case of cannabis, you have significant growth opportunity once the market is fully legal at the federal level in the US, right? And again, I'm, I'm saying right now it's about 30 billion. I really believe that on a legal market, you know, call it 10, 10 years on the road with wider distribution, product innovation, you can really get to 200 billion. And then you have to think about the rest of the world, right? I mean, like I always say, if you're walking around Berlin or walking down Las Ramblas in Barcelona, you'll smell cannabis, right? So there's no reason uh, where developed countries or based on per capita income, um, you have to think that on those markets, there's also a big opportunity. So it's a uh, it's uh, it's early days in the industry. We'll have to dis you know find out who the winners and losers will be, who will be standing there ten years on the road, who will be the, the the global players. But it's an industry with with significant growth potential, and I think that's that's a key message for people to to keep in mind in terms of your question about the nuances state by state. Yeah, very different, right? If we're looking at Canada, the really legal recreation, a lot of competition, low pricing, but there are companies that are emerging there. Uh, you know, gaining market share and also building a mode to grow overseas through uh, through exports, right? Um, just like they've done the Canadian industry in mining and forestry, you know, these companies have been able to grow on a global basis. I expect some other Canadian companies to also benefit globally from export. In the case of the U.S., um, again, state state by state varies, right? And uh, but you have you know the large operators, what we call multi-state operators, Curaleaf, Cresco, Trulieaf, Green Thumb, Verano, right? Involved in many many states. But again, stepping back to you, uh, and again, maybe long answer to your question, the regulatory side of things is very important to keep in mind. And I guess there's two schools of thought, right? Is that is this industry going to develop like the casino industry, meaning very license restrictive, right? There's only so many hotels you can put in the Las Vegas Strip, so very license restrictive with above average economics for the operators that are lucky to get hold of a license. Or is it going to develop more like a normal consumer industry where you have a you have wide uh, you have a competition and uh, um, uh, and, and just a regulated market, but you know less uh, abnormal profits, right? And uh, you look at California and Canada, very Colorado, very competitive markets. Um, you know, a market like New Jersey, more more restricted. All that said, all that said, when we're thinking about investing in these stocks, I don't like to make the assumption that the restrictions are gonna last very long, right? New Jersey, we've seen already 100 stores and affecting operator economics. I mean, there's an operator that used to sell $40 million per store, now it's around 25 million. That's still great compared to most other states. But it's, uh, you know, most of these markets will face more competition over time. And, and the question is, who are the companies that are that are able to um, to, to operate in, in, in more competitive environments, right? So again, 
uh, short answer, but long answer, sorry. Um, you have to keep a, an eye on how is the regulatory environment developing at the state level and national level, and also have a, a sense of how companies are going to adapt to that more competitive environment, right? And, that, and I think that's how you can choose stocks taking a medium long-term view. So you're essentially saying that you want to break each one, say state markets up, then there is the US market, and then you have the Canadian market, and then there's the international market. And you should probably look at each one of these as its own entity based on how its its regulatory environment currently is. And so with that being said, in the US, right, there's MSOs, right, multi-state operators that have facilities in multiple states. So when you're going to say, evaluate a specific individual stock to invest in that's operating in the US market and has footprints in a bunch of different states, all with different regulatory environments. Is it something where you kind of like weigh those regulatory environments state by state individually? Or how do you kind of evaluate right. a, a company that is operating in all these different environments? Right. So so if we try to evaluate, you know, there are many criteria to look at. We look, but, but if specifically, if we're looking at the growth potential of a company, right, we're going to look at their footprint the states they operate in, and the optionality of uh, how those markets may develop, right? So if you're a company that's operating only in very mature markets that are becoming even more competitive, like say California and Colorado, right? The, the growth opportunity from the market itself may be more limited. The, there may be companies that are like Gold Flora in California that may be in a good position to consolidate the market. But again, so uh, that's a stock that we like, and we think they're in a good position to consolidate that market. But when to your question, if we're trying to derive um, one criteria, market growth potential for MSOs will base it based on where the states, based on the states where they operate, and also based on how those markets will deregulate, right? So without, I'll, I'll try to be very brief, but so you look at, an ex, uh, at a market like uh, Virginia on the medical side is very underdeveloped, right? So once that market becomes recreational and you're doing $150, $200 per capita spend in terms of recreational uh, sales, I mean, Virginia could easily be a five to 10 times bigger market than it is today, right? Because it's very undeveloped on the medical side. And once it goes recreational, you have significant upside in terms of total sales. In the case of uh, Pennsylvania, we think that's a market that also has significant growth opportunity, but it's a much more developed medical market, right? So Pennsylvania as a market may grow two to three times. But I mean, just staying on your question, so so we try to assess what's the growth potential for companies based on their portfolio, you know, what is the optionality embedded in the portfolio in terms of uh, sales going recreational. Once we've done that, then we try to figure out, okay, so if they have a very, very diverse, so, so if uh, Virginia or Pennsylvania go wreck, what is, you know, the, does the market grow by 10 times or three times? And then if you assume the company gives their, its market share, then you get a sense of how much their sales and their and their and their EBITDA would go up by, right? Normally, going from med to rec, margins tend to improve initially because you have more demand, of course. So you make some assessment there. So you look at what's what's EBITDA growth for that specific company, and you compare it with their base, right? So what we've done. So again, there may be a company that's in Pennsylvania, but it's very diversified, right? So let's say Green Thumb, right? Green Thumb, it's in Pennsylvania. Cannabis, Columbia Care, all before called Columbia Care. It's also in Pennsylvania, but uh, the impact on the PNL of uh, Columbia Care would be greater if, uh, say, Virginia goes wreck compared to Green Thumb. In the case of Pennsylvania, to correct myself, uh, I'm comparing their Jushi and Green Thumb. Uh, Jushi has, uh, if I compare the EBITDA Delta or improvement for Jushi holdings from Pennsylvania going wreck compared to their total EBITDA, they have one of the largest percentages, right? And you compare that with the case of Green Thumb, yes, Green Thumb would benefit. But Green Thumb is more diversified, right? So we are just trying to assess, you know, what does the market go up by? Then if you assume similar market share, what is the, the EBITDA lift? And then you compare that with your, how much is that impact on your total EBITDA, right? And that's how you try to derive who are the beneficiaries. We've written that Jushi, uh, in relative terms to others, would be the one that would benefit the most from Pennsylvania going rec. In the case of uh, Virginia, it would be number one, cannabis, Columbia Care, and then Jushi, right? Green Thumb is in both states, but they would benefit less because they are just more diversified, right? Not a bad thing. But that, that's, how we, that's how we try to evaluate it. All that said, then you start literally on a day-to-day -day basis, keeping track of the regulatory discussion or negotiations between the legislature and the governor in terms of what the program is going to look like, right? So that's why it's not so simple. You look at Delaware, Minnesota, New York, 
uh, in the case of New York, intentionally the MSOs were left out initially, right? And uh, now they are coming in, but it's it, it, it's difficult for them. Very low caps, only three stores. Um, they are being able to supply the, the retail market, but there's too many illicit stores, right? They are supplying the legal stores. So you make assumptions about the growth of the market. You make assumptions of the profitability of the market and then and about potential market share. But then you have to start determining what's the what's going to be the, the regulatory environment, right? What's going to be, how competitive is it going to be? Massachusetts, Michigan are very competitive market at a lot of stores. You've seen a lot of dilution, less revenue per store, lower profit margins. So th that's why, that's why the, what I always say, when I look at you know, on your question, when we try to assess growth potential of a company based on states going wreck, we do the analysis and we write about it. And yes, there are, and the market is somewhat efficient in terms of a, if you get positive news on Virginia, cannabis and juicy holdings go up. You get positive news on Pennsylvania, similar thing. But at the end of the day, you know, we're all working on assumptions, right? Because let's see what happens down the road once those markets are legalized, how, how competitive they become and what's the actual profit pool. All that said, and I'll, again, stepping back to your uh, answering your question, someone I think wrote in Twitter a while ago that, that uh, investing in MSOs was like buying a beautiful house by the beach with a great view, and then suddenly someone would put a big building in front of it, and you didn't have that view anymore, and the whole context changed, right? What, what I disagree with, that argument is valid because, you know, you're buying MSO on the current landscape, the current footprint, but things can change drastically down the road. Um the, the the caveat to that example is that if you're a company like Green Thumb, that's been very astute and very efficient and disciplined in the way they manage their investments, is that they're always like one step ahead of the curve, right? So they invest early in these markets. These markets go recreational. They may money from them while those markets, you know, the first two years, and then they reinvest that money in new states that are going wreck, right? So so that's why they are one of only two operators in Minnesota, Green Thumb, or one of only three in Virginia, right? So they're always well positioned. So what I'm trying to say to the example, to a person I wrote about the beach house example, is like if you're Green Thumb, eventually you end up buying that building in front of a beach, right? So that's why we are, um, yes, the landscape changes, but you have to look for those companies that are being managed well enough, that have a good balance sheet, that will be in a position to continue to benefit from the, the way the industry uh, evolves uh, and the structure of the industry changes and that they can adapt, right? Someday the industry would be more competitive and we can discuss it separately. But uh, the, the point that is that, so yes, we get from, from a trading perspective, if I'm, if someone asks me, okay, what do I trade to buy Virginia? Uh, yeah, cannabis, uh, Jushi uh, are probably the best trades if you want to play Virginia, right? But then, you know, if you're talking about three, five years on the road, it's a separate conversation. Yeah. And if you wanted to trade on Florida, given the fact that most of the MSOs operate there and there's specific companies there like Trueleaf, like Verano, like Cureleaf that have heavier assets there, given the framework on how that market may play out, those companies might get a banger, let's call it bigger push if we convert to adult use? Of course, right. I mean, like in the case of Trueleaf, right, 60% of their sales come from a from uh, Florida, right? That's a market that could be three, four times larger, right? Uh, it's a well-developed medical market, but it could be much larger, of course. And truly, is in a great position. You have a company like Consortium. Again, I'm not recommending stocks here. I'm just answering the questions on a factual basis. Consortium, um, small publicly listed company, the bulk of their revenues come from uh, Florida, right? They have three stores in Pennsylvania, a small store in Texas on the CBD side, but um, but their business is mostly Florida, right? Um, you would think that Consortium is a company that someone eventually may want to buy. So there are companies, again, Verano, Air, they have significant exposure to uh, to Florida. The but but again, so that that's a short answer to your question, right? So we have a we have a sense of what are the comp we we know which are the companies that operate in Florida. We know what percent of our sales come from Florida, and as a result, you can derive right the ones that would see the most benefit, right? Cresco and uh, Green Thumb operate in, in Florida, so that's Cura Lift, and they will benefit, but they are more diversified, right? So the lift is less. All that said. In the case of Florida, of course, we have to wait for the Supreme Court. Then we have to make you know wait that we get sixty percent approval from voters. But sure, if all that happens, then you get a recreational program. What that program will look like, and when, uh, how competitive will it be? Uh, will there be caps on uh, on THC? Um, you know, how more licenses will be issued? It's it's TBD, right? When will rec sales start? But again, you know, from a stock perspective, of course, uh, truly would be a stock that. Would, it's been, it has been going up on, on the positive news that we've had from on Florida, right? With uh, Governor DeSantis pretty much uh, 
changing his tune and making it sound like it's a given that uh, Reg will go on the ballot, right? So uh, when he made that comment, uh, True Leap has been going up as a result of that. Yeah. What about from a risk profile standpoint, the companies that are vertically integrated versus just retail versus wholesale? How do you equate to those differences in order to understand, let's say, the different market dynamics at play and the companies that are well diversified to protect against that versus the ones who are more exposed? Right. Uh, the, w- w- we prefer vertical integration, but to be clear, and I will answer the question, um, you know, when we think long term in the way the industry is going to be deregulated or, or le- legalized at the federal level, you have to think in the case of beer and alcohol, right? It's in the case of beer, it's a three tier system, right? There's a producer, there's a state distributor, and then there's a retailer. And then on top of that, you have uh, different restrictions in terms of retailing. Like some states, you cannot have chains of a uh, retailer selling um, selling beer. It cannot be sold at supermarkets, right? And even if you're a retailer, uh, independent retailer, you only can have uh, one or two or three stores, depending on the state. In some states like Virginia, Pennsylvania, the state actually owns the retailing of uh, of alcohol, although that varies if it's beer, liquor, or wine. But so what I'm trying to say is that in my, in my belief, and according to the one of the the, the bills that was uh, that wanted to legalize cannabis three four years ago, uh, the CAOA, that bill had uh, a three tier system, right, where pretty much uh, you would not have vertical integration. Um, so when we think long term, federally. Um, uh, how the industry will develop, I continue to think, will be a, will be a tier system. You probably will not have vertical integration. But again, tobacco at the beginning, the tobacco companies, you know, probably own, they own the farmers, right? Now they don't. They own the brand. They own, don't own the distribution, the retailing, and they don't own the farm. They they have uh, agreements in terms of growers uh, with tobacco leaves. So we think that the same thing, the way that beer and tobacco and other industries have developed, the owners of the brands will be the ones that are in the best position, right? So in the case of cannabis, uh, long term, we think it will be the, the same thing. Very difficult to talk about, you know, brands in cannabis right now because it's still a very, very uh, initial stages of the industry. So, in your question, in your question, I, I, I answer. I'm, I'm going to answer the vertical integration question from a short term perspective, right? Being vertically integrated is better for margins, right? Because you own the cultivation, then some of that product you sell in your store, some of it you sell it to third parties. If you own your own product and you're selling it in your own stores you're capturing a bigger share of the profit margin, right? You're not selling it, you're not uh, just selling it to third parties. Um, Also, when markets become more competitive, like say Pennsylvania, um, for a retailer, uh, I'm sorry, for for a company that's just producing or cultivating, they are more exposed, right? When prices begin to come down. Uh, What we've seen in Pennsylvania as a result of deflation, more producers taking their own product and allocating a larger share of their product to their own stores, right? Because that way they compensate for the, the deflationary impact and they're able to capture a larger percentage of a margin. So short answer to your question, yes, we prefer companies that are vertically integrated because it, it's, a, it's a higher, they capture a larger share of the revenue pool and the margin pool and longer term, uh, I'm sorry, and uh, and that also helps them from a, as, as a hedge, if, if you want, to a change in competitive dynamics. But longer term, we'll have to see how that, how that, um, how that gets regulated over time, right? And when I say longer term, I'm talking five, 10 years, assuming that cannabis is legalized and how how uh, the regulator decides they want to keep, a, if they want to have a two-tier system or three-tier system. But I doubt they would keep the current vertical integration model that we have. The other thing too, I think that's important to mention with a vertically integrated model in at least the US from a cannabis perspective is that retailers, because they're kind of the end of the line when it comes to product sales, they don't have some of the other luxuries that say cultivation and processing and fulfillment have when it comes to 280E and kind of getting some of the expenses that they have to put out to run their business back. Right. So if you're just a retailer, you don't have some of these other tools that accountants kind of employ to help deal with that 280E. And so with that being said, do you think that 280E and kind of maybe however that gets rolled back, whether that I know there's a lot of different scenarios right now um, in terms of eliminating 280E for a lot of these uh, vertically integrated cannabis companies. Do you think that that could potentially be a catalyst that then forces the industry into one of these kind of like tier two tier or three tier systems potentially yeah yeah it would be it would be but also the way that the states regulate becomes also a catalyst right and i'm gonna i'm gonna answer the question but i'm gonna go back to what i said before if you look at say new york right new york is going to it's allowing the mso's 
to only have one retail store selling recreational right now. By June, they can add two more, but they have to pay a fee, right? But all of them are telling you that it's such a competitive market, right, from an illicit standpoint, and also there's a lot of new licenses being issued for stores, that the upside for them, it's not gonna come from the store, from owning the store, it's gonna come from actually supplying wholesale to all those recreational stores, right? And you could make the same argument for Massachusetts where Cresco and uh, and uh, My- Marimed do quite well on wholesaling, right? There you can only own three stores, um, uh, but there's already in Massachusetts, you know, close to 400 stores. So they will they will they will be able to the, the companies that are doing well, the MSOs that are doing well, are actually wholesaling there are gaining market share uh, across all those stores, right? So so as a catalyst, some states are forcing companies to become less vertically integrated and to become more of the what I call the wholesale model, right? In terms of your question about uh, 280E, at the moment it applies to all plant touching companies, right? Even if you're a retailer in California, you are also a cannabis retailer. 280E also applies to you. Right, but but you are right in the sense that depending on the business model, there's less uh, what you can put in cogs. Right, if you're on the retail side or you're on the cultivation side, may vary, and that may have an accounting impact on on, on what percent of your profits are are exposed. Right, but but if we step back, bigger picture, of course, you know the removal of 280E would be a significant catalyst for the industry. Right, you end up paying 21% of gross of um, your tax rate becomes 21% of your profit before tax as opposed to gross profits, right? There are different numbers that we've published at length on the subject, uh, but of course, removing 280E would be a big catalyst for the industry. There are companies like Green Thumb that's paying right now about 70, 80% of their uh, profit before tax in, in income tax, right? When reality should be 21%. The, um, and, and for some companies, right? If you're a company that makes 50% gross margins, but you're losing money on profit before tax, you get even a bigger lift, right? So, so removing 280E will be a big, uh, a big benefit for the companies from a cash flow perspective and from a great standing perspective. But if, if we step back for one second, right? If, if your question, I don't want to jump the gun here, but if the question is, do we expect rescheduling and is rescheduling important? I think the question, without a doubt, rescheduling, removing 280E, it's a significant catalyst for the group and stocks would move up significantly. I think someone, you know, said that we we'll go up through the roof. I don't like to use, you know, exaggerated comments like that. But yeah, the 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 the, the benefit for uh, for uh, for stocks from rescheduling would be significant. All that said, and here I'm jumping ahead maybe to your question, we still don't know how rescheduling is going to be implemented, right? We agree that cannabis for the last 50 years has been wrongly classified as Schedule 1, but uh, and now the HHS has recommended, right, based on the research, that it should be a Schedule 3, like, uh, you know, ketamine and other products. The concern I have is that, yes, it's going to be good that we don't have 280E applying to the industry anymore, but um, does moving cannabis to Schedule 3 open another can of worms, right? Right now, when we talk about cannabis, the scheduling, it's, it's not bifurcated, right? It's just cannabis. But if you look at what's on Schedule 3, they're all, you know, compounds or capsules or, 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 or drugs that have been approved by the FDA. And they require a prescription and they are uh, by a doctor and they are supervised and monitored by, by the FDA. So, you know, what are you going to do once you're in Schedule 3? Are you going to uh, are you going to need a prescription of recreational cannabis, um, or, or are you going to separate, or, or, or are you only going to apply that to medical? So how do you reschedule Schedule Three, right? Everything on Schedule Three requires a, a prescription. So I think the concern I have is that the the assumption, the conventional wisdom view that it's being I don't want to say it's being fed to the public, but the conventional wisdom view, the narrative, is that you will get rescheduling. Cannabis moves to Schedule 3, and then the DOJ is going to issue some type of memo or edict that pretty much says, look, it's a Schedule 3 product, but everything else, you know, leave it to the states. So what's being done today doesn't change, right? It's supervised by the state. Medical cannabis are tested at the, at the local level by the states, their labs, uh, and recreational cannabis is regulated by the states. So it's like nothing else changes. I believe it's going to be very difficult for the DEA to do that because there's another no product, and I've checked, obviously, on the CSA that has that type of exception, right? If I'm a pharmaceutical company, I could come out with some type of drug and say, you know what, let that drug be regulated in Georgia this way and in Pennsylvania this way, but uh, we won't have any FDA rules at the federal level. So I think it's, I think that I'm not saying I know why the DA, the DA has taken so long, but um, it's going to be interesting to me 
uh, to see how how rescheduling plays out. Yes, we want rescheduling. It's going to be good for the industry. But I think the DOJ and the DA will have to decide in terms of how it gets implemented, right? And that and, and there are some risks there because um, today you don't need a doctor prescription for a medical cannabis. It's called a recommendation, right? It's not really something that's supervised or monitored by the FDA. So, so things could change uh, significantly. And um, But we, we wait and see, right? We wait and see and uh, we, we, we think in terms of scenarios, but I don't agree with the, the narrative I mean, the narrative is that because it's rescheduled, right, you get rid of taxes and it's good, there's more research and all these things. But I think that you're going to have this bifurcation between rec and med. And, and, and I worry somewhat about that, what that, that will mean for the industry in terms of the way it's regulated at the federal level and the state at the state level. Sure. And I think all those are fair. And given the complexities that you laid out and then all the unknowns going forward, I can only imagine how many different scenarios you've modeled out. But one of the things I want to ask you about is you said, if we get Schedule 3, the stocks will go through the roof. Is that? No, I didn't, I didn't say that. I said that someone else said that. Sure, you know? sure, sure. But just kind of <laughs> I, understanding. I that no, I, 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 I share. Fair. I, I want to be careful. About it. Yeah. Sure, sure. But just like understanding the nuances with that, is that based on the fact that this will be a relief and then there's a certain percentage benefit for all these stocks that you think will revalue right. that to kind of play into that assumption to what you think that may be? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, there are, again, you know, it, it, it frees up cash flow. Uh, it improves your balance sheet. There are companies in the space that are heavily indebted, right? So so 280E will be beneficial for everyone, but it will certainly be more beneficial for companies that are more financially stretched, right? And that it will uh, facilitate their, you know, if you want to say their survival, it will uh, it will make it easier for them to renegotiate debt, right? It will put them in a better position to uh, to expand and, and to raise equity, right? Uh, to shore up their balance sheets. So the market, although it's a very illiquid market, has been somewhat efficient in terms of ways reacted to rescheduling news. Because stocks, I'm not going to mention them, but stocks that are financially weaker from a balance sheet perspective have tended to move up more than others, right? And uh, and that makes sense, again, because uh, uh, the, the benefit for some companies in terms of cash flow relative to the structure of their balance sheet or the cash flow benefit relative to a small market cap can can be very significant, right? So, I mean, we cover state house, we have an overweight on them. State house is a company that has a, a stretched balance sheet, so the impact would be significant. And on top of that, the impact compared to their market cap would also be significant, right? So we wrote about them as being one of the, 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 the beneficiaries. But again, the whole industry will, will, will benefit. So rescaling news is good for, for, for the group and uh, you can invest to it, invest in the group through uh, ETFs that are out there or through individual stocks. But uh, but look, I mean, if I'm right now, you know, am I recommending stocks on the on the assumption that rescheduling will happen? To be honest, no, right? I mean, I, I do hope that rescheduling happens and uh, that it will be a positive catalyst for the group. But I'm also concerned that there will be some uh, some uh, restrictions imposed in the industry and that you will have rec and medical bifurcated. So that, again, that may open another kind of work, right? So right now, I'm more focused on stocks in terms of their exposure to uh, to states that may go rec, like like we talked about. Um, I think that, that those will those are real potential catalysts, right? Let's see what happens with Florida Supreme Court. Let's see what happens with uh, Yankin in Virginia, the governor, Pennsylvania. You know, as legislature agree, Ohio. I, I'm more focused on that in terms of U.S. stocks than necessarily rescheduling. If you want to compare to the average analyst or investor out there, I have more of a nuanced view in terms of the way when rescaling happens and how it happens. In my opinion, what you get and what we've written, right? So I'm not, so I'm not from running anything here. I'm, I'm a, what I've said in the case of rescheduling, at the most, I believe, and I, we're talking scenarios, of course, because we don't know what will happen. Um, I believe at the most, the best case scenario is that you get the DEA uh, announcement that they agree to reschedule cannabis, right? But how that will be implemented I'm afraid that it gets left to the to the next term, right? So it's pretty much the White House saying, look, re-elect me and I will uh, implement the rescheduling of cannabis. But I think that's as good as it gets. I don't think we get more. And, and partly because there's a lot of nuance in terms of how they, they have to negotiate and agree in terms of after the public comment, in terms of how rescheduling gets, uh, gets, uh, gets implemented. It will still be positive for stocks, but not as much as... Uh, as if it were to be fully implemented, like, you know, with immediate effect, uh, 280 goes away, let's say June 1st. I, I don't expect that to happen. I think that you get the announcement at best, 
and then uh, the implementation and the how will take uh, will take longer. A little tease piece for uh, yeah. the next step. One thing though that we haven't mentioned about rescheduling and the drop of 280E is it does, from my understanding, kind of open the door for institutional investors, right? So from your conversations with institutional investors, is this something that that holds weight? I mean, I've heard that a lot of like the larger institutions won't even come close to investing in the industry until it has been rescheduled and the 280E thing kind of has been decided. Um, and then that will open the door. I mean, the State Banking Act, they say, doesn't really move the needle for like a lot of the, your big banks. Um, is that is that true? Is that kind of some of the, the dialogue that yes you've and heard? No, right. So what you want, let me step back for one second, right? So Tilray, Aurora are stocks that are listed in NASDAQ, right? And uh, because cannabis is federally legal in Canada and they export to about 40 countries where medical cannabis is also federally legal, right? So, so you're right. But despite the fact that those stocks are listed in NASDAQ, you know, the institutional inv investor involvement in those stocks is maybe 10 to 12 percent, right? 88 percent of a free float is still in the hands of retail investors. So we can ask ourselves, like, why institutional investor participation in those stocks that are NASDAQ listed is so limited? In part, it would be, I would say, because of the volatility, because the economics haven't worked out so well for them, and because only recently, I think people have begun to get a better appreciation of the export opportunity, right? So, so what I'm trying to say, What's the I could say so, so. What's the difference if you're going to get uh, U.S. stocks uh, uplisted in Nasdaq and, and uh, NYSE? Are um, are uh, institutional investors participate more? In in theory, yes, they will participate more. But uh, in the case of Canada, it hasn't happened that way. The assumption is that the U.S. of course has much better economics, uh, much better structured market at the moment that will attract more institutional investor participation, right? But I would say the answer to the question first. Let, let's do a caveat there that it takes a lot, right? It takes an of listing, it takes custody by by banks, and also it takes fundamentals, right? So investors, for them to to get involved in the space, you have to have the fundamentals. It, it, it hasn't happened in Canada. We believe it will over time, but uh, the moment is limited. In terms of your question specifically, does rescheduling legalize cannabis at the federal level in such a way that that all banks could participate in the industry and the exchanges could have list? The way it's being told in terms of a narrative, my answer is no, it doesn't have it, right? But but what you are asking, it's part of investment debate. So I'm not telling you I have a view, but I'm not telling you I, my answer is the only one. Because again, if we go back to the narrative, right? Because this is like, you know, wanting to cut the cake and eat the... Uh, in the case of the, the MSO narrative, is that you're going to get rescheduling, you're moving to federal three, but it's not legalized at the federal level because you still have every state having their own program, Right. So if that's true and you're not legalizing at the federal level, then the NASDAQ and YSC are not going to do a listing and banks will still be uh, limited in terms of their interaction with the space. So, so that's why th there are some contradictions in, in terms of a narrative, in my opinion. Right. But, uh, but what you're saying, there are people that will tell you that, sure, if you move, move it to Schedule 3, you're essentially legalizing cannabis at the federal level. But then the same MSOs will tell you, no, I mean, that's not what we're saying. What they are saying is that they want to keep every state keeping their own program and keeping it legal at the federal level. If you keep it illegal, then, you know, you don't, you, you, you're not uh, solving the problem, right? Which is you want a listing and you want, right, some form of safe harbor. So again, safe harbor, I mean, so stepping back, best case scenario for an MSO, right, which is what we cover. And of course we support the industry, but, you know, we're talking here for investors. Sure, the best case scenario is that you, you get rescheduling, you move it to Schedule 3, taxes go away, you keep the state programs as they are, so no federal interference, so it remains illegal at the federal level, but the DOJ comes out with a memo or some form of edict that says, uh, this is the way it's going to be implemented, but we are going to, uh, we're going to provide safe harbor, so exchanges are allowed to uplist stocks, and banks are allowed to interact with the industry, right? So if you get, if you get that, that's, of course, that's the best case scenario, right? And, and, and investors, institutional investors would, would participate. But again, I go back to what I said at the beginning. So all of that has to happen, you know, which is quite nuanced. And I don't know if you will get all of that. I'm doubtful you will get that this year. But once you get all of that, the institutional investors are start asking you, right? Like, okay, what are the fundamentals of this industry, right? What do, does it look long term? So that's why I say, again, when we talk about institutional investors, remember the example I gave about General Mills and Kellogg, lots of interest, and you would say, I don't want to say boring stocks because it may sound disrespectful, but you know, but so, so yeah, someday you're going to get those investors here. 
But they want to ask, uh, they want to be asking you questions like, is cannabis like beer or wine? Wine, a very fragmented industry uh, in terms of brands, beer more consolidated, right? And those are the questions that these guys are asking me, right? These long-term only investors uh, that are still looking from outside. So they're going to be asking those type of questions. They want to be asking, they're not going to be buying a stock for the next month. They're going to take a long-term view. So they're going to look at the balance sheet, you know, how well diversified those companies are, uh, not the stock that's going to pop because of, um, you know, some some news headline, right? Sure, there will be institutional investors that play the short-term game, but if you're thinking long-term, I think that they will be very selective, right? At the moment, you have the ETFs out there. Um, the, there's a lot of correlation in terms of the way these stocks move up and down, uh, in part because of ETFs. But uh, but in the future, where you have heavy institutional investor involvement, I'd say that's going to be a lot more uh, more selectivity in terms of what stocks do well. And, and there, I would go back to fundamentals, right? Strong balance sheets, strong brands, well diversified operations, good execution, that type of thing. Yeah. One of the areas that I was really excited to read was your analysis on Germany. And I'd love for you to give a quick breakdown on that market and then just kind of put into perspective Gurleaf, who has a good position out there. Can you make any comparisons into kind of domestic markets so people can understand kind of the opportunity at hand for how big Germany may be? Right. So, so, so look, I mean, the big picture when we talk about recreational cannabis is that the European Union is 700 and, you know, almost two times the population of the US, right? So, so apples to apples a big opportunity there. In the case of, uh, because of uh, regulatory issues, recreational cannabis is far away, even in Germany, in my opinion. What you have in the case of Germany that makes it very interesting in the short term is that they they, they already have medical cannabis legal at the federal level, right? So you would say Germany from medical cannabis, it's more legal than in the US because in the US medical cannabis is illegal at the federal level. But the problem in the case of Germany is that it has been used as a last resort, right? Doctors have to uh, pretty much uh, try three, four other things before they prescribe it. So right now, and, and it is reimbursed by the public insurance companies, but it's, it's, very, it's a very small market. Uh, the cash market is beginning to develop because you also have people that don't use insurance, just pay out of pocket like in the US. But uh, that market we calculate is 30,000 patients. So on, on average, on average, the 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 German medical market right now, although it's federally legal, is very underdeveloped, right? So if I want to throw a number, I would tell you that you know in Germany, zero point two percent of the population is in medical cannabis. In Florida, it's three point five percent. In Pennsylvania, it's four percent, right? So so all else equal, if Germany, as a result of a change in the narcotic law, that in a way reschedule cannabis, right? So it's an easier process to prescribe now, supposedly starting April 1st, they still have to go through some procedural issues in terms of getting it approved. But um, you want to have a situation in Germany where it's a lot easier for doctors to prescribe, right? And that's going to be a, all pretty much online consultation, the whole process. Um, you have access to online pharmacies. Doctors will be less stigmatized and more prone to prescribe cannabis. So you would have a scenario where Germany becomes a Florida or a Pennsylvania, right? If you go from 0.2% of the population in the cannabis program medical and you go to 4%, that's uh, that's a 20 times bigger market, right? So it's it, that could be explosive growth in the case of Germany. Uh, believe it or not, al although it's a new market, it's quite concentrated, right? Tilray, Aurora, Kuralif um, are, are big participants in those markets, right? And uh, Kuralif, the, it's only MSO, the Canadians export from Canada to Germany, and they sell their own brands there, right? Companies like Tilray and Aurora I just mentioned. In the case of Curalif, they own capacity in Portugal, and they own a distributor in Germany called 420 Pharma, but they are also very well positioned. They, they claim they have about 20% share in flour. Of course, it's a very small market. It will develop. But those are companies that are well positioned to uh, to see the growth of uh, medical cannabis in Germany. There's the, the example I gave you, you know, could be 20 times bigger if, if it's like Florida or Pennsylvania. There's also talk that perhaps the market is going to be, uh, there's going to be more range uh, insurance reimbursement, right, which you don't have in the U.S. So, so it's going to be interesting how Germany develops and how it grows. And of course, there's uh, the knock-on effect to other markets in 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 Europe that could follow Germany in terms of a more linear, a more flexible approach to medical cannabis, right? Whether that's the UK, France, or Spain, so it could, it could create big opportunities. So far, in my opinion, the US company is the only visionary one from a global perspective. Obviously, has been Coralif, right? With their their effort there, so we give them kudos for that and, and big opportunity. And then the Canadians, I would say, 
I, I think that something that hasn't that people maybe haven't paid enough attention is that what I gave the mining and forestry example, right? Why are Canadian companies so successful overseas in forestry and mining? Well, in the case of cannabis, because they develop the mode, right? And uh, I, I think that in the case of cannabis, they are also developing that mode and the know-how. Uh, they are, you know, large large exporters to uh, to Australia, which, believe it or not, is a bigger market than Germany right now. So these Canadian companies are also well positioned to do well as overseas markets uh, open up. Um, and remember, you cannot export from the U.S. to Germany, right? You are exporting from other countries where it's legal. So again, I mentioned Tilray Aurora as companies that could have have an upside there in in those markets. Do you have any guess or feel how you think the EU kind of opens up? Do you think it'll be more country by country, kind of like it is state by state here? Or do you think it'll be more of a collective, unified approach? So far, so far, it's been more country by country, right? But again, the German government wanted to have recreational cannabis. You know, this this current coalition government wanted to have recreational cannabis. They couldn't get it approved by the EU commission. So they had to go back to something, you know, uh, uh, less, less. Um, I mean, just focusing on re- the regulating the medical market. I think that it's going to be case by case, right? Paul and Czech, they will go step by step. Are, are we going to have a scenario? I think that what may happen is, is so the, the short answer is country by country, step by step. But I think this you can do the analogy with the US, right? The more states are legalized, right? We're at 13A, 39 that are medical. Uh, we're close to 24, right? Almost half of the states are going to be recreational. At some point, that weight politically, right, in the U.S., more senators, more representatives in Congress uh, from states that have legalized cannabis, that puts pressure at the federal level. I think the same thing would happen in Germany, right? I mean, in the EU, as more countries participate in medical cannabis, more deregulated or quasi-legalized rec, you would have uh, the commission do something more drastic. That, but again, that's that's more lo- longer term. But again, bigger picture, if in tobacco, right, it's an industry that's consolidated with Altria, Philip Morris, or in soft drinks, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola. Are we going to have that in cannabis? I know it's hard to visualize and it's way long term, but I think it will play out. And uh, that's why I feel a lot more comfortable saying to people, if you want to put money for your college fund, for your kids in some cannabis stocks, and of course you do it in a very selective basis, taking a long term view, the, the right stocks. I think that I, I'm a lot more comfortable saying that than telling people, um, you know, hey, these stocks are going to go through a, uh, going to go through a roof in one month's time because we're going to get rescheduled. And if I may, I, I might have said this before, but you know, the math that we use, I'm very brief, just to make a long-term argument, right? I talked about before, you know, that the market in the U.S. once it's legalized and you have innovation, less stigma, more distribution, could be a 200 billion dollar market. If you assume it's a tier, right? So it's wholesale. Uh, retail is separate, and you say, okay, 100 billion, you know, 200 divided by two, so you have 100 billion for a wholesaler. You apply 20% market share, you apply a 25% to beat the margin, you take a 20 times multiple, you get to a market cap for a stock of 100 billion, right? The largest company in the US in market cap right now is below 3 billion. So that gives you an idea of the upside, right? And, and those are not numbers that we're taking out of thin air. It's just uh, looking at, you know, the way industries have developed. I mean, the, the multiple that I'm using for 25 times for an industry like cannabis may be conservative. So so we think they have long-term upside, right? But in the meantime, you know, so that so I stand by that. On the other hand, you know, we know of individual investors, private investors that bought these stocks at the peak in February 2021. And here they are down 90% over the last two years, right? And uh, so so it's, that, that's what I'm saying choose wisely the, the right names and take a long-term view. You want to play the day-to-day on cannabis? That's risky, and I'm probably not the right person to talk to about that. That's really fair. All right, quick prediction time. Pablo, considering the complexities and the nuances of the cannabis industry, is there a unique selling proposition that will merge as a critical differentiator as the sector evolves? Um, number one, I would say companies that are, are developing a strong brand portfolio I would say that that's a key criteria for me. Number two, companies that are that have a strong balance sheet uh, because of that prevents you from dilution. And, and number three, you know, I, I would I would focus on companies that are building a global mode um, and, uh, because I think that that it's not just about the U.S. market. Yeah. Kellen. I'm going to take a slightly different approach, and I think that um, from a USP perspective, I think that eventually long term these companies will kind of end up in one of the the tiers, if you will, from like a tiered model perspective, right? So I think there'll be certain companies that um, are really, really strong with brands, 
right? And I think that having really, really strong brands is going to force those companies into divesting their manufacturing footprint in order to focus on what is making them money. They'll start outsourcing, right? A lot of the manufacturing capabilities to meet demands for their brands, which then also gives you the opportunity to find a, a company who has poured a significant amount of capital into the manufacturing sites, right? Like there's a lot of these really large kind of smart factories being built from these MSOs too, that then they could be more of a, a wholesale provider, right? So I think that as far as USPs goes, and of course, global, I admit that I, I agree with Pablo. I think there's a, a massive global aspect to it as well. And so I think as far as USPs, I think you do need to kind of maybe pick certain horses that are, are racing specific races in order to be successful long term. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I think both those are really strong. And I think exactly like Pablo was saying today in the short term, understanding the states that can kind of give these uh, companies a little more of a boost. But long term, I think exactly like you were saying, Kellen, is, is these companies need to understand exactly what they do better than everyone else. And maybe it's one part of the, the food chain, but that involves understanding from a nuanced level, the specific details that they're operating at and having all those numbers that are not always readily available from these newer markets, these newer companies that are operating in those. So kind of relying more specifically on how the company operates and making sure they lock in their numbers so they can forecast better, but they also can make more actionable, better decisions as they continue to go forward. Yeah, no, agreed, agreed. So Pablo, for our listeners, they want to get in touch, they want to read your research, where can they find you? Yeah, they can email me at uh, pablo.swanich at uh, swanichgroup.com, P-A-B-L-O dot Z-U-A-N-I-C. But uh, yeah, um, all I'll say, you know, on that on that question is that you know the way we write our research, of course, is more focused on institutional investors. But retail investors are welcome to reach out, and we can share our research. We do so at the moment. Historically, you know, as an analyst working for a bank before, you know, I go and tweet, right? And if I wanted to put something on LinkedIn, I had to go through like two or three layers of compliance approval. So, uh, but but I'm happy to uh, to share the research. It's not investment advice, right? But if it helps people. Um, I, I would look at it. So look, I mean, if I step back just to summarize uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, I would say number one, in, in the short term in the sector, there is a trade which is supposed to be based on rescheduling, right? But personally, I, I'm going to be very cautious about pushing these talks on rescheduling because I think it would be a very quick pop because what I said before, right? It could be an announcement and that's about it. Um, uh, and on that point, if you look at the MSOS ETF as a proxy for the group, when you got the rescheduling news in late August, it went up and peaked in mid-September. And then by end of, uh, I think, uh, end of October, we were back to the levels of uh, early August, which of course didn't make sense, right? Because you, you had the news of rescheduling. So, but I'm just saying this, if you're playing the short-term game, people can take profit very quickly, right? So on the rescheduling news, yes, you're going to get a pop. I have a more nuanced view of what may happen, but you will get a pop, uh, but, you know, in and out. That's what I would say. Number two, I'm a lot more comfortable recommending stocks not on 2 ADE or rescheduling, but on state on state legalization, right? And if you had to rank them, you know, Ohio has already been approved. They just have to agree very quickly. I think Pennsylvania will follow. Florida will take longer, but there are catalysts, right? Supreme Court, uh, Paul, uh, ballot in November, how it legalizes. And Virginia is very binary, right? It's uh, the, the the legislature has agreed pretty much on a, on, a, on a document, and now the governor has to decide if he's going to veto it or not. I'm, I'm I'm skipping a few steps there, but I'm just saying I'm very focused right now in terms of uh, what states legalize. And you mentioned it before, True Leave. It's a, a the clear beneficiary for Florida. There are others, of course. In the case of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, I say Jushi. Uh, 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 Virginia, you have Jushi and you have a uh, cannabis or Columbia Care. So I think I'm more focused on that in terms of those catalysts. But then number three, long term, I look at what I call companies with a strong balance sheet, right? Uh, Mary Meda would put in that category, although it's a smaller ca it's a smaller size company footprint in terms of quality names. You know, Green Thumb, very well managed company, diversified but executing well. Cura I like their global vision, right? So those are. Those are names that uh, that we recommend. We like Cresco in terms of the wholesale business, the way that there's a lot of question marks about the strength of brands and where we are in the industry in terms of brand development. But we think that Cresco is a company that executes well in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts markets uh, on, on the wholesale front. And I think we would keep uh, an eye on that. I know we've talked a lot about the strength of brands that matter, but uh, I know that in the in the short term, it's difficult to, to make arguments about brands when some of these markets are so much a silo each state, 
Uh, and there's very few national brands, right? But uh, but brands do matter. But but so yeah. So point number three, you know, look at look at companies that are building a, a mode, right? Whether it's uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, I'll plug in a few names here if you don't mind. But when I say on point number three, I'm just saying you're developing an asset that's going to be worth something, right? Is Planet 13 going to become the hard rock of cannabis, right? The hard rock cafe of cannabis. Yeah, or Planet Hollywood, if you want. I think they are. They are in that direction, right? Especially with what they're doing with their uh, Las Vegas operation. Cresco, I like what they are doing in wholesale. Curalif, I like the global vision. Green Thumb, I like the way the companies manage uh, as a platform, right? But, um, you know, th- those are just some names to, to keep in mind there. But, um, yeah, that's, that's what I have to say. But, again, to summarize, um, if you want to play the 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 the, the group day to day, it's very risky, right? And uh, but if you want to play it thinking long term, for sure there are names that you want to consider right now. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for taking the time. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. My pleasure. Guys, if you've enjoyed this podcast over the last few years, can you please take three minutes or less and leave us a quick review on Apple or Spotify? All reviews make a massive difference for us and help other people like you find this podcast. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you.